beauty was said to have launched a thousand ships. When the civilization that lies buried here was flourishing, it was a time before history. It was a time when you could stand here in this place and watch chariots charge across these plains, the glint of sun on bronzed armor. If you listen carefully, you can hear the clash of sword on sword. Scholars search the pages of the Iliad for clues to the elusive connection between this physical site and Homer's mythic Troy. According to Homer, ancient Troy was a glittering city. It was beautifully wrought. It had palaces of gold and great walls all around. The sun shone and the crops were bountiful. The river Scamander, the lifeblood of Troy, flowed through the plains to the sea which lay at the gates of the city Homer called Ilium. And Zeus, the immortal Greek god, smiled down on the Trojans from Mount Olympus. Of all the cities under the sun and starry skies, wherever men who walk the earth have dwelled, I honor sacred Ilium most with my immortal heart. The Iliad Book Two. The great mystery of Troy is whether or not the site that we gingerly identify with Troy has any association whatever with the site of the same name which the Homeric epics recount. The community of Troy back at the end of the Bronze Age, around the 13th century BC, seems to be uh, a fairly sophisticated kind of place, like um, the late Bronze Age palaces all the way from Greece to Mesopotamia. The citadel of Troy must have been very, very lively. It seems to have been a, a port of entry, a port of trade. It was a very wealthy site. It was well known by cultures as far away as uh, the south southeastern Mediterranean. Homer's epic tale is spun out of 500 years of oral history. It begins with the telling of the story of the Trojan Wars, when Paris is sent by his father, King Priam, ruler of Troy, across the Aegean Sea to the city-state of Sparta. He is to form a truce with the Greeks, his mission would result in anything but peace. Paris attends a banquet given by Menelaus, the ruler of Sparta. There he falls instantly in love with the wife of Menelaus, Queen Helen, said to be the most beautiful woman in the world. Dazzled by her extraordinary presence, Paris abducts Helen and spirits her across the sea to his home to Troy. Once there, she renounces her husband and children and abandons herself to her love for Paris. The kidnapping sets in motion an alliance of the Greek city-states the likes of which the ancient world had never before known. One question that comes up for, for just about everybody in connection with the Trojan War is the question about Helen. Was there a real Helen and was uh, the war fought for Helen? We today would believe that there are many economic factors that would have led to such a war. However, women were major factors in these conflicts between cities and between one king and another. So it's quite possible there was a Helen uh, over whom the war was fought. Agamemnon, the brother of Menelaus and the ruler of mighty Mycenae in ancient Greece, is the field marshal of the troops. And out he marched, leading the way from council. The rest sprang to their feet. The sceptered kings obeyed the great field marshal. Rank and file streamed behind and rushed like swarms of bees pouring out of a rock hollow, burst on endless burst, bunched in clusters, seething over the first spring blooms. The troops assembled. The meeting grounds shook. The Iliad Book Two. The Greeks set out in hot pursuit of Paris and the abducted Helen mounting a huge flotilla of more than 1,100 ships 
carrying 100,000 men. When they arrive at the coast near Troy, the Greeks set up encampments at the edge of the water and lay siege to the city. In the ninth year of the Trojan War, the Greeks hatch a plot inspired by one of their greatest military commanders. Odysseus, also known as Ulysses, conceives an ingenious plan. He orders the construction of a huge horse made of wood. We have no direct evidence for a Trojan horse. I think probably most specialists would at least raise an eyebrow over this and be just a little bit skeptical. The labor takes three days. When the beast is finished, the Greeks wait for night and deposit this horse outside the gates of Troy. The construction is designed to seem like a peace offering. The Trojans regard the horse as a sacred beast, but unbeknownst to the Trojans, it is filled with Greek soldiers. The Greeks then retreat to the coast and by all appearances set sail for home in the few ships that remain. The Trojans awake to find the trophy and are overjoyed with the apparent retreat of the Greeks. They drag the wooden beast through the gates and into the city, never suspecting the mortal danger hidden inside. A drunken feast of celebration follows and continues far into the night. Exhausted, the Trojans collapse in the streets, filled to bursting with wine and feasting. As the night waits for the break of day, so do the Greek soldiers hiding in the great wooden creation, a creation that will be known forever as the Trojan horse. Finally, the rays of the new day break over Troy. The warriors secreted in the belly of the beast crawl out of their hiding place and throw open the gates of the city. The Greeks slaughter the startled Trojans without mercy killing the men, enslaving the women and children. It makes no sense to us the war ends with this big horse that the Trojans are so foolish they don't even open the doors on the side and look inside it. Um, cities tend to get taken in Greek stories through trickery, and in actual Greek history too, through trickery rather than through a direct assault. Odysseus is the master trickster of ancient Greek history. Therefore, it makes sense that he would come up with a master trick to take the city. When the carnage is over, only Helen is left alive. Her husband Menelaus is about to kill her, but is so dazzled by the beauty of her naked breast that he drops his sword and falls to his knees at her feet. This is the story of Troy as recounted by Homer. Is it history or is it myth? The mysteries of Troy evoke intense interest on the part of classicists and archaeologists, uh, even those who are just faintly interested in the literature of the period, uh, because the story is so good and the heroic characters are so interesting in their own right that nobody wants the site itself or the story itself to be pure fiction. A glittering city on a Turkish hilltop, a woman so beautiful that her face launched a thousand ships, and a mysterious weaver of the legend who wrote it all. Parts of a puzzle that seem to get more complicated with each piece that is put in place. Perhaps there is no better place to ask about the origins of the Iliad and its immortal author than here, at the archaeological site in western Turkey believed to be ancient Troy. But the search for the origins of the poet known as Homer takes us back in time to the 13th century before Christ, when the legend of the Iliad was born. The stories of the Trojan War and all its glories were passed in oral form down through the ages from singer to singer until the 8th century BC. At that time, they were set down by a poet many called Homer. Homer 
Homer is an incredible personal genius. And this particular telling, this particular singing of the Iliad, and perhaps also of the Odyssey, um, made everybody's hair stand on end. They couldn't forget it. Someone was able to capture it in writing and did. It was not, in my view, Homer himself. Although Homer's persona looms large on the map of history, he remains as much of a myth as his characters. Some scholars question if there ever really was one person responsible for the epic. They feel that the Iliad is an amalgamation of the best of the oral tellings of the Trojan War story set down by a scribe. This ancient journalist may have used Homer as a gnome de plume. The traditions had it that he was a blind poet, that he was inspired by the muses, by the gods of poetry and music and so on, and they put all this poetry into his head. Sing to me now, you muses who hold the halls of Olympus. You are goddesses. You are everywhere. You know all things. All we hear is the distant ring of glory. We know nothing. The Iliad, Book Two. The young Homer would attach himself to some great oral poet. He would spend many years hanging around, listening to the poet doing his stuff, and would gradually start to remember a lot of the expressions that the poet used. But what he was doing is not so much memorizing poetry as learning a technique of improvising poetry. Homer, it seems by general agreement, was just by far the best of these poets. Of all the characters of the Iliad, Helen is perhaps the most enigmatic. She appears infrequently in the stories, yet she is the force that drives the legend forward. Who was the woman who brought nations to battle? The woman with the face that launched a thousand ships. Then we have this mysterious figure of Helen for whom both the Trojans and Greeks were willing to fight. And the Greeks of the historical period were themselves perplexed as to why they would have fought so long for, for the woman. In the Iliad, Paris is challenged by one of the Trojan warlords to give Helen back to the Greeks and end the slaughter. Paris answers this way. Now I say this to our stallion-breaking Trojans. I say no, straight out. I won't give up the woman. But those treasures I have hauled home from Argos, I'll return them all and add from my own stores. The Iliad, Book 7. Over the ages, myth has built on myth. There's a story recorded in the 6th and 5th centuries that says that Helen never actually went to Troy at all. That at the beginning of the war, what happens is Paris loads her into his boat and is about to sail off to Troy. The gods decide we can't have this, and they intervene, and they spirit Helen away to Egypt and send a phantom to Troy instead. And the Greeks spend 10 years besieging this city that she's not even in. And they only find out afterwards that she was in, in Egypt the whole time, and the whole war was just this ridiculous joke the gods played on them. For some, Helen is not a human being, but a personification of the fertile plain surrounding Troy. Here, overlooking the Dardanelles, we can almost envision Homer and the heroic characters who inhabit the pages of his Iliad. We can almost see them here at Troy, on the hill of Hisserlik, restored to all their former glory. Whether real or mythic, we can almost feel a kinship with the people who lived and loved, fought and died here. What can all the ancient artifacts tell us of this city that vanished so long ago? Archaeologists at Troy continue to uncover the bones of people and animals. Troy today. An archaeologist gingerly extracts a delicate spear point from the accumulated debris of three millennia. This is the first human contact with this remnant from another age in more than 3,000 years. 
It was buried here 1,200 years before the birth of Christ. If I were at Troy and knelt down and picked up uh, an arrowhead or a spear point or something like that, it would probably overwhelm me. And I have a feeling that what would happen is that many of the stories that I'm familiar with from the Iliad would come flooding back sort of into my mind and I would almost be recreating, you know, for myself a lot of the events that Homer talks about in the poem. This spear tip and all the implements of this time were made of an alloy of copper and tin called bronze. This metal gave its name to the entire age. The Bronze Age encompasses the years from roughly 3000 to 1100 BC. This city, which is called Troy, was settled in the early part of this age, and the Trojan Wars of the Homeric epoch, if they ever truly occurred, marked the end of the era. The early Trojans were a combination of two peoples. The Thracians came to Troy from what is now continental Greece and Turkey across the Dardanelles. The Phrygians, whose homeland was in Asian Turkey, had migrated west. The first habitation at Troy dates to 3200 BC, fully 2,000 years before Homer's legend takes place. The city was situated at the edge of Asia Minor on the mouth of the Dardanelles. Through the centuries, they enjoyed the benefit of a strategic location. Today, as then, this narrow neck of water is the gateway from the Aegean to the Black Sea and the riches of the East. The strange combination of tides and winds which prevail in the Dardanelles to this day forced sailors of the late Bronze Age to wait in the shadow of Troy for favorable seas. Even when conditions were right, passage to the Black Sea was a treacherous proposition. It was the 13th century BC, and seafarers had not yet learned to sail against the wind. If you go to Troy now, it's quite a long way inland, several miles inland. It's very possible, though, that uh, back in the late Bronze Age, in the 13th century BC, uh, that the coastline, in fact, came in a lot closer. When Homer describes it, uh, the, the coastline is basically a brisk walk from the walls of the city. Today, the digs at Hisserlik are about 10 kilometers from the shore. The bays Homer describes have silted in, and what were once marshlands are now fields of oats and cotton. The Hittites were the dominant civilization of the Trojan era, and their written records may provide a missing piece of the puzzle. The Hittites, uh, in some ways, their culture seems to be rather like the Mycenaean culture. And uh, they kept lots of records on small clay tablets. And some of these refer to a great kingdom to the west called Ahiyawa, um, which sounds very similar to the ancient name for the homeland of the heroes, Achaea. And so some people think that Ahiyawa is referring to Mycenaean Greece, Achaea. It is also from the Hittites that we have the first possible written confirmation of the existence of the people of Troy. The clay blocks, which have come to be known as the Hittite tablets, date between the 18th and 13th centuries BC and make brief mention of a place called Willusa. Some scholars speculate that if the W is dropped from Willusa, making it Illusa, you are closer to Ilion or Ilium which is Homer's name for Troy. Another fact that we have from the Hittite tablets, there is a particular important person at Willusa whose name is Alexandros. And Alexander is another name for one of the most important people in the Trojan War, namely Paris. So 
is that coincidental? Is it like saying, well, Smith, you find the name of Smith at two different sites, thus they much, must be connected. Mm -hmm. But it, it's another piece of the puzzle. By 1800 BC, horses were introduced to Troy by the Thracians, who lived to the north, across the Dardanelles. Recent excavations at Troy have unearthed hundreds of horse bones. Though the significance of the find is not yet clear, they could serve to confirm Homer's label of the Trojans as horse tamers. By 1260 BC, the city of Troy sat high on the hill called Hisserlik, which had been formed by the ruins of several civilizations being buried one on top of the other. Each of these layers is given a Roman numeral from one to nine. Homer's Troy is generally assigned to layers six and seven. Troy six is a magnificent site. It's a wealthy site. It's a site that is clearly known by a lot of other cultures for its goods, as a trading center, uh, whatever its value may, may have been. And hence, a site worth taking. Troy 7 is a rather miserable contracted site and not so well worth taking, but it does show signs of cluttering, of clustering of people who've come in from outside, who have embedded in the ground large storage jars in, in the, the very floor of the small little hovels that they've thrown up very quickly. It would indicate to many, it does to me, signs of, of siege, signs of people who regularly live outside of the fortification wall being driven inside, their conditions not being very good, but living in those conditions far preferable than the alternative, which would, which would be death. Ultimately, the story of Homer's Troy is a story of war. Archaeological evidence shows two burnt layers of this city we call Troy, which correspond roughly to the time in which Homer's epic is set. These layers together with the artifacts point to a great conflict, a war and siege which many choose to call the Trojan War. What is there here to connect positively the hill of Hisserlik to Homer's Troy? Scholars keep returning to survey these ruins, searching for clues. The site of Hisserlik is a reasonable site for Troy because in a general way it obeys the mandates of the Homeric, the Homeric poems. It is a, a city uh, of some dimension, which is high-walled enough to require a siege to take it. It is close enough to the sea to enable the Greeks to get to and from their ships in reasonable order. And it has a stream uh, running through the plain, which corresponds to the stream, the Scamander, which, which Homer mentions in his, in his poetry. Had it not been for Homer's great epic poem, would so much attention have been brought to bear on this Bronze Age settlement? One man changed forever our perspective on this place and this poem. In 1870, a German self-made millionaire set out to find the lost city of Homer's Troy, a well-thumbed copy of the Iliad tucked under his arm. With brutal fervor, he excavated what was then an ordinary hilltop, and in the process, pried open the lid on one of the world's most compelling historical puzzles. Until the 19th century, the only place Troy could be found was in literature and in our collective imaginations. For Troy seemed destined to be forever located only in the pages of Homer's Iliad. Then in 1872, a prosperous German merchant set off for Turkey, armed only with a copy of Homer's book. He was on a personal quest to find the legendary city. His name was Heinrich Schliemann. Some people think Schliemann was one of the world's great frauds. He was certainly one of the world's great psychotics. Whether he was a fraud is another matter. Uh, Heinrich Schliemann in the past 
several years has had a fairly bad press about his honesty uh, and the way he conducted his scholarly affairs vis-a-vis -vis his colleagues. Nonetheless, you cannot dispute the fact that insofar as Bronze Age archaeology is concerned, he kick-started it into existence. Schliemann spoke 12 languages, including Greek. This facility and a keen business sense had turned him into a millionaire at a young age. All of his accomplishments in commerce were merely a prelude to what he considered his destiny, to find the lost city of Troy. Despite the fact that mid-19th century scholars considered a belief in a physical Troy to be folly, Schliemann never gave up his stubborn contention that the real Troy lay buried somewhere in western Turkey. In 1869, Schliemann made his home base Athens, Greece. There he met and married a beautiful young Greek named Sophie. Then in 1872, he set off for Turkey. When Schliemann arrived, it was the boonies, there was nobody there you know, other than the Turks. There were ruins everywhere. I mean, it's very hard for an American to, to visualize this, but that whole part of the world, there are ruined cities every you know, few kilometers. You come along and you'll see, just lying out of a field, you'll see a Corinthian column or something like that. While traveling through Turkey, he met an English expatriate named Frank Calvert. Calvert told Schliemann of his theory about a hill known as Hisserlik. Schliemann began applying his litmus test to Hisserlik and two or three other hills which were equally promising candidates. Using the Iliad like a treasure map, Schliemann eliminated all but Hisserlik, a mound about 130 feet high and 700 feet across. Reasonably convinced that Hisserlik matched the Troy Homer was writing about, Schliemann secured a permit from the Turkish government and hired an army of shovelers, which sometimes numbered as many as 100 men. Using clever literary detection and extraordinary confidence in his own gut instinct, he found what thousands had missed through almost 18 centuries of searching he located the physical site of what we refer to as Troy. But his excavation method was less than subtle. What happened when he started digging was that he, much to his surprise, found this tremendously complicated, tremendously deep sequence of ancient cities piled one on top of another. And he just sort of bulldozed through the middle of these things, yanking things out of the ground, demolishing buildings that got in his way, whatever struck his fancy. The farther down in the hill he dug, the cruder the material became. So what he found was not one Troy, but nine Troys. And they were stacked up like a wedding cake from top to bottom, from the youngest right down to the oldest. Uh, Schliemann himself had no idea what he discovered. By May of 1873, Schliemann and his crew of shovelers had been at work several months. One day, he dismissed the workmen early. Something had caught his eye. According to the account in his diary, Schliemann jumped into the trench and began clawing the earth, shoveling, ripping material away to get at the glimmering objects buried there. From the dust of ages, he extracted a hoard of gold. There were cups, brooches, other jewels, and more than 8,000 gold beads. In the version of the story Schliemann wrote in his diary, he handed the objects up to his wife Sophie, and she transported them in her skirts to a safe place. With their hidden treasure, Schliemann and Sophie stole out of Turkey. Thus began the mysterious odyssey of what some believe were the jewels of Helen of Troy. While in Greece, 
Schliemann photographed his wife Sophie in the jewelry, calling the headdress which he himself had fashioned from the loose gold beads the crown of Helen. The news flashed around the world in bold headlines, Schliemann finds Priam's treasure. His fame thus secured, he donated the objects to a museum in Berlin. Not only was the authenticity of the treasure challenged, but its origin was also in question. His account of the finding of the treasure of Priam is full of fabrications. He said that Sophie, his wife, was with him. We now have proof that she was in Athens with her family at the time it was found. Some people think they found records from um, market dealings in Istanbul to suggest that Schliemann actually bought this treasure uh, on the open market, took it to Troy, sent away the workmen, buried it in the walls, yanked it out in order to have a big publicity scoop. The treasure of Priam remained unharmed in Berlin for the next 70 years. Then in 1943, Hitler ordered all German art treasures crated, catalogued and secured in various bunkers and repositories around Germany. But then Berlin was liberated in 1945. The treasure vanished. I went to Troy in the summer of 1993. I thought I was going to do a story on the archaeology there. The day before I get there, the Russians announce that they found Schliemann's long-lost treasure of the so-called treasure of Priam. The Russians admitted that the treasure was found in the basement of the Pushkin Museum. Had it been kept there since the end of the war? Or had there been other mysterious detours for Helen's jewels? Is the treasure still intact, or have pieces of the hoard been filtered off? The reason everyone wants to get a look at it is between the time it disappeared in 1945 and the time it resurfaces in Russia in 1993, a lot has been discovered about Troy and a lot has been discovered about Schliemann. But whether he's reviled as a charlatan or revered as a genius, Schliemann will not be forgotten. He died in Naples, Italy, in 1890. Each day, archaeologists work at Troy. They are confronted with a ditch that in some places is 50 feet wide and 100 feet deep. It's called Schliemann's Trench. This savage scar that tears through the middle of Hisserlich is the legacy of Schliemann's discovery. This ancient city that may well be Homer's legendary Troy. To the world in the last part of the 19th century, the hill of Hisserlik was an exotic place, wrapped in puzzles and promises. It was a powerful draw for other archaeologists of the day. One of them was Wilhelm Dorpfeld, a German architect. Dorpfeld was no newcomer to Troy. He had accompanied Schliemann on his last two digs. In 1893, Dorkfeld returned to the site alone. He was trying to reconcile the small two-acre area that Schliemann had uncovered with Homer's description of the great city of Troy sprinkled throughout the Iliad. You get this vision from home of this grand place with enormous fortification walls. And when you get there, it's probably not much bigger than the size of a football field inside these walls of Troy. It's hard to imagine all the action of the Iliad taking place there. Schliemann, and then Dorpfeld after him, suspected that the walled city Homer wrote about was the uppermost and innermost ring of habitation on Hisserlich. It is called the Citadel, and it would have accommodated about 1,000 people. Dorpfeld began excavating outside the Citadel wall. There he found larger rectangular houses on a terraced landscape surrounded by a magnificent masonry wall. What he didn't realize was that beyond this second ring of habitation, there was an even larger part of the settlement that would not be found for almost 100 years. In 1990, the current archaeological team at Troy 
discovered the foundation of the true outer wall of the city. Scientists mapped a barrier almost one quarter of a mile from the center of the city. They actually dug away. They didn't find a wall, they found a trench. A ditch actually cut into the bedrock. And the archaeologists now think that that was um, the face of the wall, that if you want to make a high wall, dig a ditch in front of it and then put the wall behind it. And that makes the wall that much higher, that much harder to climb over. And that's what they found. And that makes Troy a much bigger place. It makes it a more suitable candidate for Homer's Troy. At last, a true picture of Troy begins to emerge. This new find reflects a settlement of perhaps 6,000 people. Science is closing in on the mystery of Troy. In 1932, a professor at the University of Cincinnati in Ohio, Carl Blagan, reopened the Troy digs. When Blagan took over the dig at Troy, it was said that the site was a ruin of a ruin. He set up the task of organizing the very pieces of archaeological evidence that Schliemann and Dorpfeld had unearthed. I mean, most laymen come to archaeological museums, they see these pottery bits and their eyes glaze over. Uh, Carl Blagan was a master. You could dump a truckload of pottery bits on a big table, and Carl Blagan could walk down the table sorting them out by time, just by looking at them. In 1939, he set off for Western Greece, looking for the elusive connection that would link the Mycenaeans to the site at Troy. There he had what has been described as the most remarkable first day in the history of archaeology. While digging in an olive grove, Blagan stumbled upon 600 clay tablets in an indecipherable language, later called Linear B. These were later dated to the 13th century BC. Could this be the written proof that would place the Mycenaean Greeks on the shores of the Dardanelles and thus bring Homer's Iliad closer to factual history? The tablets prove that the people from Mycenae were indeed Greeks and possessed this form of writing in the late Bronze Age in a time that corresponds to the Trojan War. At present, we know that there was a flourishing civilization on the mainland of Greece during the Bronze Age. We know that there was contact between certain of the mainland Greek sites and Troy, but we have to take a jump. It's a leap of faith to have Mycenaean warriors encamped near Troy, causing any of the disturbances that we see there during this period. To this day, there is still no direct link of the physical Troy with Homer's story. The current debates about Homer, about Troy, uh, the archaeology and the oral and literary tradition are very simply unending. The poem is a mystery in the same way that human life is a mystery. The Trojans really come to symbolize all of us as human beings, that all of us ultimately are going to face our own demise. That in a sense, I think what Homer does and is able to really capture is a sense that we all live in the city of Troy. And so Homer brings the reader full circle, from reality to myth and back again. All roads may lead to Rome, but even the Romans would agree that they start here at Troy. Here where evidence of the myth may be only the turn of a stone away. It is that electric moment when clouded legend turns into tangible fact that lures us on in search of history.